Oh, this meeting is being live streamed. Mm -hmm. Got a little alert there. <laughs> hello, 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 everybody. I think we are live. I hope so. Let me check the page up. Oh, let me get out of here. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I am just trying to get myself in order, get my duck up. Oh, we are live. I hey, am man. excited. There we go. Hey, today is going to be a, a very fun day. We're going to let everybody kind of come in. It is just now right about 12 o'clock on the dot. Yeah, so we, drop top cruising the street. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly what Shannon said. So we are going to hop in. We're not going to take a long time to wait on everybody because we want to make sure that we cover everything that we need to cover. Um, this is a lunch and learn, and I'll say this again, about grants, writing grant proposals. Uh, and in just a second, I'll introduce the two individuals who I'm so excited to be on here with, and they are going to give you a little more information than I have, but I am going to be their partner in crime on this lunch and learn. So um, let's see what's going on. If you have some questions about grants, please pop them in the comments. I will be the majority of the time, probably Shane and I looking at comments mm -hmm. and we will get some questions over to Mary Elizabeth, who is our grant specialist. I'll talk about that some more in just a second. And we want to make sure that you get everything you need answered when it comes to funding and writing grant proposals. Um, to my alumni community, I send out grant proposals, uh, I mean, grant opportunities, probably at least once a month, a long list um, of grant opportunities. I probably need to separate that into twice a month. I'll do that, but it's a lot. But you guys are always asking about funding and you really enjoy getting these funding opportunities. This is going to help you out a lot. So. Uh, let me see, Jen, you want to do the um, sound test? I know Marcia is yeah. double checking. Oh, over. Marcia. No, you, she can put it in the chat because she's yeah. on the Facebook page. So, Mary Elizabeth, can you say something real quick? Uh, hello, I'm Mary Elizabeth coming to you live from Vermont. All right. So, and then I'm Shana, obviously, and you just heard Jaren. So, Marcia, put in the chat or come back in and let us know if, if all the sound is working. Technology is a funny thing. You know that, Jaren, you got to make sure all the, the things are working, all the ducks are in a row. So, um, if the sound is off, y'all put some comments in, let us know what's going on. Otherwise, we're going to get this thing going. We good? All right. All right. Okay. We are going to get this going. And Alexis, welcome in. I see your question. We'll get that to um, Mary Elizabeth and Shana in just one moment here. But as mentioned, I am with two phenomenal individuals. That's my word of the week, ain't it, Shana? Oh, yeah. yeah that, that's my word. This is, this is the third third or fourth time today. Me and Jay had two meetings, so I'm keeping tabs at this point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, today I am joined by our grant specialist, our corner-to-corner -corner grant specialist, who has been doing our grants. I guess it's called writing our grants. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not sure, uh, but we'll find out together since we have started. Is that, that correct? And uh, this individual is Mary Elizabeth. So uh, welcome, Mary Elizabeth. Hey, yep. Mary Elizabeth, tell us again where you're joining us from. I am joining you from Vermont. Vermont. I know that's right. Uh, and if you don't know, you better know. The other individual joining me on this is our executive director. Get it, Shana. Hey, get it. Uh -huh. Shana. And so she, hey, hey, hey. So she's going to be able to, to speak into writing grants as well. So um, without further ado, I'm going to look at some questions, but I'm going to let Mary Elizabeth dive right in and she's going to start talking to us about some best practices when it comes to grants and some other information and Shana will be chiming in as well. You have the floor, Mary. Awesome. Thank you, Jaren. I'm excited to be here to share with you this little tiny bit that I know of a world that is super duper huge. Um, so we're going to talk through the grant writing process today and it's it's a process. So grant writing is like this really teeny tiny piece of the whole process. Um, so we're gonna go through that whole process from being grant ready to getting the money and what you do after it. Um, and Jaren, feel free to chime in if someone drops a comment or a question that's relevant to where we are in the process. Shana, jump in with your wisdom, your expertise. Um, but we're just gonna we're just gonna walk through this process because it's it's a process. It's not just one and done sort of thing. Um, so first, before you ever apply for a grant, you have to be grant ready. Um, and so this there, I think there are three parts of being grant ready. First, you have to know who you are. If you're a nonprofit, you've got to have your 501c3, your solicitations permit, your board of directors, you got to have all these documents together 
Maybe you're an individual, maybe you're a business, you have your EIN, you have your tax ID number. You have to have all of these pieces together before you can apply for a grant. What I do is all of my important documents live in a folder on my desktop. So whenever a grant asks me to drop in attachments, I'm ready. I don't have to go searching for them. Just a time saver. I like saving time. We all do. The second thing you need for being grant ready is to know what you're doing. So at Corner to Corner, we have the Academy and we have Script to Screen. And I know these programs inside and out. And I'm essentially able to pitch them to people, to whoever it is that has the money. I can pitch my program to them um, and sell it and get them to get on board with what we're doing. So I know what I'm doing. I also know what I'm not doing. I'm not looking for grants that are about conservation or are about building houses, because that's not what Corner to Corner does. That's Those are great, great projects. I support that, but that's not the grant that I need. I'm not going to waste time pursuing a grant for something that isn't us. So knowing what you're doing is super important when you're being grant ready. The third thing is knowing what you need. So I know our budget, like I know our programs inside and out. I know where the holes are in our budget. I know that we have a lot of grants for curriculum development. So that's not something I'm focused on right now. I know where the holes are in our budget and I'm looking for grants that are gonna help us fill in that holes. Or I know that Marcia has a great idea for something new she wants to do. So I'm looking for grants that are gonna help meet that need fill in that holes and help us keep moving in that direction or in this new direction. So first thing is being grant ready, who you are, what you're doing and what you need. We got, we got on that. Can I jump in there? Yes. I think you gave a lot of great points guys. And if y'all are taking notes, please write these things down because before you're ever really finding a grant, everything uh, Mary Liz was saying is so true. One thing when she was talking about um, knowing who you are and knowing you know what you do, if you don't have a mission statement, every grant, I would say almost every Mary Liz, there may be, I may be an over exaggeration, but they ask for your mission statement. So if you don't have in, in week one or two of the academy, I have the book in front of me, but we work on your mission statement. And so you should be constantly revising that and have that just like you have your tax information or your EIN number, because that is so important. And then have it somewhere where you can copy and paste it. I've seen so many people when they do grants, Every time they put a mission statement, it's different. I'm like, friend, it should be the same thing. Copy and paste. Like, don't feel like they're, these grants are sharing notes. A lot of these things are really the same. And then the second thing I thought I really like that you said that people do when they ask me about grants is that they try to make fetch happen. Like, they try to say, well, this is about conservation, but I'm trying to conserve energy through biking and there and it's like why are you wasting your time going after something that somebody is going to actually really fit into and they're going to get it find the ones that you feel like i have a high probability of getting this and then give your all into it um because otherwise you're spreading yourself thin and you're gonna get a lot of rejections and feel like you're not good enough when in fact you're not focused on the things Sorry, we're just testing the audio. I'm um, having all the things that you need. Uh, and then you said one more thing that I was like, yes, yes, Mary Elizabeth, say that. What was Feel free to interrupt me. What, what you need, thing? your budget, where your holes are in your budget? Yes, your budget. And so your budget has to be, it's an art form, right? Because Mary Elizabeth and I work together on the budget and she challenges me on things like, and, I, and we challenge each other. She's like, Shana, how much does this really cost? Or I'm like, girl, you know, inflation is inflating. Okay, we got to factor those things in. So it's an art and a science. So if you're like, I don't know my budget, A, don't lowball yourself. Because if you're like, it's going to take me $1,000, then you're going to have to fill in the holes. You want to have a little bit of leeway to do it in excellence. But also, you're going to have to account for that money so you can't over overprice it. So what we do at the Academy is we found some small, some federal data. The Small Business Administration has data that we use to be our, our baseline. And of course, we've done the Academy a number of times. So we can look at historical data. And then we also look at inflation, right? Those three things are kind of the triangle that we decide how much is it going to take us to graduate an entrepreneur. So we have a number for that. How many entrepreneurs do we want to graduate? Um, how much, you know, does this graduation event itself cost? And how much am I paying my staff? Bada boom, bada bing, more or less. I'm sure there's a few other numbers in there that I don't have in front of me. We have a really preliminary budget. And so we found times that we've overshot it. And then we've been able to be like, oh, great, we got a little extra money. Let's let's do these things. Although sometimes a little extra money stresses Mar uh, Mary Elizabeth out. She's like, girl, you got a lot of money to spend. I'm like, she's the queen of spending money. Just tell me where. Um, but then also, if you go too small, you really are lean on 
on the way you can do your programming and things that you can afford. So uh, you want to have both of those things. And then, Mary Liz, I do have a question for you. So most of the budgets, people either don't pay themselves or they think a grant is going to allow them to pay themselves $80,000. Yeah. So operations costs or salaries and things like that are usually a percentage of the larger amount. Can you talk a little bit about that? If you had that later on, then, then tell me to wait. Yeah. But I think that's a really important question that you just can't say $80,000 and I'm going to take my whole salary from this one grant that doesn't work like that. Yeah, super important. I am going to kind of touch on that, but we can go into it now. Grants know what they want to pay for. They're going to pay for salaries. They're going to pay for materials. They're going to pay for tech, but they're not going to pay for rent, utilities, payroll taxes, those sorts of things. And so when you're reviewing a grant before you even apply, you need to know what they're going to cover and if it's if it's worth the work that it takes to get that money. Um yeah. And that's why like we have curriculum on lockdown right now. I'm not looking for grants to develop curriculum. I'm looking for things like salary and utilities grants that are going to cover these other places that aren't currently covered under our grants. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Keep going. I just wanted to, to, to second yeah. those things and give them like some next step paperwork on it. Yeah. I love it. Um, Jaren, any other questions that we should cover before we move on to the next step in the process? Um, I'll Yes, can you repeat, uh, we had a question from Kyle. He just asked, can you repeat what you need in order to apply for grants? I think you talked about that early on and then we'll come back to some of the other questions in the comments. Yeah, so the three things you need to be, you need to know to be grant ready are who you are, what you're doing and what you need, like financial wise, budget wise. So you, like things like if you are a nonprofit, you have to have an up-to-date 501c3. Mm -hmm. um, you have to have a list of your board of directors. You have to have a list of your staff, depending on how big the grant is, they may want job descriptions for your staff. Um, and when I say how big, I mean like hundreds of thousands versus if it's like 10,000, they're not gonna get that deep. And then you also, depending on how big your org is, may need to have an audit. Um, Cause every year, start, if you make more than a certain amount of money, you have to have an audit. So these are, these are way past things you're looking for, but more so either your EIN number or your 501c3 status and then the things you need for a nonprofit itself, which is your board of directors list and your staff list. Yeah. Yeah. Even right. your staff of one too, you gotta have stuff about yourself on there. Yeah, I've had, we've had grants that ask for resumes for everyone involved in a project. And so, yeah, those are fun. I've built, I've built resumes for everyone on the team. <laughs> I know <laughs> all y'all, I know everyone. I know you're sorry. making up stuff. Jaren, Jaren went to Vermont. That, he's like, no, he didn't. No, I'm just kidding, y'all. This kid, don't do that. Uh, I'm not, no, we're not going to make things up. Um, LinkedIn. <laughs> LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Um, <laughs> I have stalked everyone. It's fun. Um, anyways, so being grant ready, that's step one. The second step is finding the grants. And this is, it's super fun to just find, find the people who are going to give you money. It can also be really time consuming. Uh, it can also cost you money. There are lots of databases out there that will find the grants for you. And they're amazing. They put all of the information in one place. They save you a lot of time, a lot of legwork, leg work. but again, you have to pay for those databases. It's normally a subscription-based service. And so you have to take that into consideration. Instead of doing that, here are some other options. One thing you can do is look at similar organizations. So look around you to see who else is doing work similar to you, who else is working in your same geographic area, and look at who's giving them money. Um, sometimes that'll be on a part of their website, our community partners, our, our funders, things like that. Um, and really dig into these people's websites. Also look for press releases on them. Uh, just anything you can do to find out who's who's funding these organizations. And that can tell you a lot about where the money is in your community for your organization. Another thing you can do is sign up for Google Alerts. I have about half a dozen different Google Alerts that I get once a week. And so I read through all those articles to figure out where there might be money or to learn more about similar organizations. A third way is joining Facebook and LinkedIn groups. I have gone a little haywire on LinkedIn lately. Um, there are grant writers that I follow. There are professional organizations that I follow. There are similar organizations that I follow. Coming back to that idea. Um, and I, I'm plugged into all of these different communities just to keep a pulse on what's happening right now. Um, and so I, I find new grants through that all the time. Um, people are posting like, I'm writing this application. Oh, did you see this one? Um, so that's 
really helpful is plugging into that network uh, and also signing up for any newsletters you can find that send like weekly. These are the funding opportunities right now. And you kind of have to sift through that information, but there are nuggets in there and they're definitely worth, worth sifting. Uh, the final way or final place you can find grants is through networks of foundations. So these are out there. They exist. They're little clubs for founders, for organizations, for businesses, corporate sponsors. If you dig through membership lists on some of these places, uh, then you can find, again, it'll be some legwork, but you have this list of people who have money, and then you just have to figure out who matches up with you. So those are four main ways that I like to find grants. Shana, mm -hmm. anything to add there? Yeah, I, those, those are really good. I haven't done any of those things, but I will say this is if you are listening to Mary Elizabeth and you're probably like, oh, she does all these things because it's her full-time job, right? Yes, and she helped us when we, when she was first, first starting, and I think it's important, Mary Elizabeth, to illuminate. Um, it was really just her and Will working, you know, trying to do things. So, of course, he did some and she did some, and so you have to just make a schedule. The same way you may go to the gym on Mondays and Wednesdays, on Tuesdays, you look for grants. On Thursdays, you read the ones you found. And then you put on your calendar when you write them. And I think the writing gets a little quicker as you have written some and you, um, you know, can resave them. And so when you're listening to all the things, it feels overwhelming. But you just have to get a rhythm and then get a head start. So I, I have a question for you, Mary Elizabeth, about a head start. But um, get a head start on that. And then secondly, just find one avenue. Because you have to remember, like, we're powering thousands of people, you know, almost a 20 person staff, we're, we're powering a lot of money into one place. So if you have one program that happens once a year and you're the only staff member, you can find lower hanging fruit. You don't have to do as much and go for as big dollars um, as you think. And then another thing I think you mentioned, but I also like to you can ask people in your real network who you know in real life. So a lot of people who work for corporations, they have philanthropic or foundational arms. Like if you know somebody who works at, I don't really know if this is true, but let's just say Bank of America, right? And so like, hey, my cousin work at Bank of America, they may have like a mid-level job, maybe not like a teller, but somewhere in the mid-management. Hey, do y'all have a, a foundation that maybe you can get me information to and maybe I can use your name as when I apply? Try to go for something that feels like it has a little bit more of a connection than just like these ethereal I don't know, spaces where you're like, I don't know anything that's going on um, with that. And then you start to build because then you have some data to show what, what you've done before as well. But I just, I, I heard all that and I felt like, yes, that works when it's your whole job, but it's hard when it's not your your full job. So Mary Elizabeth, if, if, they, if they're like, I have five hours a week to spend on this and you know, what should they do? And then secondly is what's the on-ramp? Like how far, if they're looking at the end of August, what do you think is a realistic first grant turnaround? Is it October? Is it September? It's not next week, right? So like, right. no, it's not you know, next week. You don't want to try to write a grant in a week um, unless you already have built a system to, to write grants, which you probably haven't. I think giving yourself a month um, is definitely mm -hmm. a good, a good idea. Cause that gives you time. If you're looking at five hours a week, I think for some simpler grants, a month is definitely doable. It gives you time to make sure you have all of your paperwork in order. Now, if you're just now applying for a 501c3, you're gonna have to look a little bit further out. But assuming that you have a board, you have a 501c3, you have all of this paperwork in order, you can get, you can apply for a grant in the next month. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Go ahead, Jane, you got something? Yeah, I, I do wanna, I wanna make sure, this is all phenomenal information, but I do wanna make sure that we get our questions in as we continue to talk about grants. So a good question is, do well is there somebody to help you with writing grants i guess like a grant consultant uh, or whatnot yeah you can hire grant consultants um i think i mean they are definitely out there the hard thing with a grant consultant and this is i mean i work for corner to corner i know our programs i know our budget i know who to who to ask when i have a question um if you're a grant consultant you're starting from scratch and so if you hire a grant consultant they're starting from scratch. So if you were to go out and hire a grant consultant, you would want to have a packet to give to them saying, this is who we are, now go find the money for us. Um, so that they, you're not paying them to do the legwork, you're not paying them to build something from scratch. Um, you have your mission statement, you have your paperwork, you have your board again. Um, and so you're giving them a starting place. Um, but if you hire them and you have nothing, 
you're going to have to pay them a lot to get you anywhere. Yeah, I, I would assume that starting off, you probably want to try and try yourself first to write a grant before hiring somebody and see how well you do. Because I, I would assume a consultant could get expensive. Yeah. Uh, and when you're maybe bootstrapping, if you're not wonderful, but if you're bootstrapping your business, that could be pretty costly starting off. Uh, your whole grant going to paying them, paying them yeah. for writing the grant. Right. And, yeah. and, and it doesn't actually work that way. The grants have restrictions and requirements mm -hmm. on what you do with the money. It's not just like ball out, pay somebody yeah. whatever you want. And then the second thing to that, and in my opinion, as, as the executive director and you looking at leadership, there are classes you can take, right? So the Center for Nonprofit Management has a grant writing class. Some community colleges may let you audit or just go to just that class without trying to get a degree. So use Google, you know, look online. There's plenty of grant writers who have courses. If you have money to spend to learn, I would make sure that you are learning because you can't check homework for for a, a group that you don't know what they're doing, right? If somebody was like, Shana, can you check my calculus homework? I'm not going to know if it's right or wrong because I don't know how to do calculus. In the same way, if you're looking over a grant, you're not really going to be able to give specific directions because you literally don't know what they're doing. doesn't mean you have to be a grant writer. I'm not a grant writer, but I have written grants. I have talked to foundations. or I have reviewed reports. Or I've gone to trainings about what to do. And so we can collaborate. Mary Elizabeth and I, because I have some kind of background knowledge. And then she may say, no, because this is an is. And I'm like, cool, I'm persuaded. Um, and then vice versa, right? I may give her things to think about based on things that I know too. So you can't check homework for subjects you have no knowledge about. So you still should know something. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like Nashville has a lot of resources for people who are just trying to figure this out. Uh, there are multiple universities there that have um, social enterprise programs. And so I feel like you could also maybe tap in to Belmont or Vanderbilt and see what resources they have to help you learn this skill or find someone who can do it or help guide you through the process. Yeah. 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 Cool. Uh, real quick, Alexis, you had a question, but I don't see it anymore. I don't know if you deleted it, but if you can pop that question back in the comments for me. And, and one other question, uh, Mary Elizabeth and Shannon, y'all might be able to speak to this. Do you have to have great credit to apply for a grant? I've never found that question in a grant, um, but we have nonprofit status. So there are probably, there are grants out there that, that do go to individuals or there are fellowships that are for individuals and the process is similar to applying for a grant. In those, it might be different. That's all I got. Yeah, nonprofits don't, have like we have tax exemption right mm -hmm. so um that is a little bit different and i would say i've never seen a grant even for individual like the small business owners that ask about credit versus loans right they definitely look at your personal credit but if you see that question and you don't have great credit if it's an open-ended question you could talk about how your credit has grown you could talk about some ways that you separated your business and personal credit if you have a business credit card that you pay back on time um, or you can talk about a mentorship. Like I would explain if that if that is the case because people who got great credit and got money ain't applying for, ain't applying for this loan. So you may be similarly situated credit wise with everybody else in the bucket. And if yours kind of jumps off the page to them, they might be willing to overlook it. But I haven't seen that question either. But again, we're a nonprofit, so they don't really ask stuff like that. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Um, well, yeah, we'll, Mary Elizabeth, we'll, we'll keep uh, rolling along and I'll, we'll okay. keep pulling the comments and questions out of, out of the comment box here. Okay, cool. So we are on step three of my process that I wrote down to share with you guys. Um, so step one was, I, I, I like steps. Um, I love step it. One I'm being, for it. Operationalize. Um, step one is being grant ready. Step two is finding the grant. And step three is researching the grants. So let's say you are grant ready. I don't know where should I start left or right. Um, you are grant ready. You found a grant you want to apply for, but now you want to know this funder. You would not go into a room full of business people and pitch your business until you've done your research on those people. You want to know who's in the room so you can sell it to them. You want to know who has the money so you can sell yourself, your organization to them. You can start by looking at their website, figure out who they care about, what they care about, their geographic focus area, their pillars. Um, you can uh, figure out how much money they're giving, what the application requires. Figure all of that out before you even start writing the grant. 
You can also find their 990, um, which I've gotten really nerdy and I love looking at founder or foundations 990s because it can tell you a lot about their past grants. You can find 990s um, by Googling the organization's name and 990. Um, websites like GuideStar also have 990s up there for you to look at for free. There are a few others out there. Um, but on about page 11 of every foundation's 990, you're going to see all of their past grants. So who's getting the money and how much and what's the designation for that grant? Is it for a specific project, a specific program? Is it general operating? Um, and I love looking at 990s to, to figure out, are we a good fit? Are we similar to other organizations that they've funded in the past? And how much money should I ask for? If they're giving grants that are like five to $10,000, I'm not going to ask for 50,000. That's ridiculous. And I know that. Um, but if on the, at the same time, if they're giving grants that are 50 to 100,000, I don't want to ask for five. I don't want to overshoot or undershoot myself. So the 990 is super duper helpful. And I do all this what research. What is a 990? What is a 990? I don't, I don't know the official. Well, like, uh, is it like a tax form? Is it like oh, yeah. Sorry. Report? Yes. Like, kind yep. of how, does, how does it show up in the world? Yeah, it's their tax form. Um, it's showing their income and their expenses. And so a part of that is where they're sending money, um, where they're sending grants. It'll list right. out their board, um, their address. So that's also helpful to see like, oh, are they, if I'm looking for an organization that has a really common name, I can check the 990 to know, is this the one that's in Tennessee or is this one in Colorado? Just mm -hmm. a random thing that happens sometimes to kind of know their location. Um, and also in that grant section, page 11, um, it's going to have the detailed information for who's getting the grants. Um, so like I was looking at a grant that didn't have a website, uh, but I looked at who was getting the grants and they were all in Memphis. And so I'm like, oh, okay, their, their geographic focus is in Memphis. This isn't a grant that I need to prioritize because they've made it pre pretty clear where their focus is. And we're not, we're not really there. Maybe someday, no pressure. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I'm kidding, <laughs> kidding, I kid. Um, but the 990 just is really helpful to figure out. Um, am I relevant? Are they going to be interested in me? And if they are, then how much money should I ask for? Uh, so all that to say, research is super important. I find it really exciting. Uh, it's like trying to figure out if this is a good match. It's like almost like online dating when you're looking at a funder's <laughs> website. Um, it's a horrible analogy, but that's, that's the big important research piece and it's really nerdy and I kind of love it. So, yeah. Yeah. But if you feel like that's not where you, like where you shine the research piece, mm -hmm. what, what kind of, um, advice would you give? Would you say like, keep it small? Would you say keep it local? Like what, what's their first step if they're trying to get, let's say by the end of the year, they want to get $10,000 from either one source or multiple sources. What, what would be your advice there? Mm. I think my advice, if you're trying to get $10,000 by the end of the year is first look at who's funding similar organizations mm -hmm. and then find the nine nineties for those foundations or those funders. Yeah. So you can find that stuff. I mean, frankly, you can find our some of ours. We're, we're doing a website revamp, so we haven't updated mm -hmm. it. But you can look on our website and see who has at least, you know, sponsored us in the past. Or look at our graduation on our thank you to our partners page. Has people who fund us. And then if you feel like you are simply situated to us, then Google the people who fund us. Mm -hmm. Google, because you have to remember, like, you're not taking money out of anybody's pocket. If they want to fund us, they're going to fund us. If they want to fund both of us, they're going to fund both of us, right? This is just how it works. Um, and we do that with our with our partners as well, and, and it's kind of a cyclical experience. And then people start reaching out to you because this is not about, or is it about family foundations, or is it more about traditional orgs? Um, or I mean, it can. I would say any and all. Okay. But, yeah. Because the foundation is just people who pay money. A lot of families, it mm -hmm. may be like Jaren's whole family, the Spicer family. They may say, "Oh, we have a everybody's going to put in this amount of money, and now we have a family foundation that you know that's not." I know it's like, I never heard of that term before because I hadn't either, but that's yeah. basically what yeah. it is. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, before moving forward, somebody said, I need her. Well, uh, Mary Elizabeth has a job. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. She's, she's busy doing work for, for corner to corner. Um, <laughs> you, you can probably find somebody similar, but um, but another question You're is... Place to to. Yeah, all right, exactly. Yeah. I won't, I won't, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> um, so, 
we had a question. So I guess where should we start is kind of with the maybe the three pillars that you already mentioned, Mary Elizabeth, is where somebody should start for grants. But um, they they did ask, is there a best time to look for grants? Maybe the beginning of the month, the middle of the year, beginning of the year. Let me look at my grant calendar. <laughs> so this is what I do is I write down all the grants and I plug them into my months when I'm going to apply for them. Um, February is a really big month for grants to apply for grants. Um, and then I have a lot in September right now. So those are kind of the two really busy months. I would definitely say like February is a big one. Um, I don't know why, but that's kind of where most of our grants have fallen. Um, some places will have quarterly grants. And so if you look at their website, you'll see that um, they'll be like, all right, we have a board meeting once a quarter. You have to submit a grant one month prior to that board meeting to be considered. Uh, and so those are really nice because you have a little bit of flexibility. Um, like I was working on a grant. Uh, I was like, oh, I'm going to apply in November. And then three months before I was like, I have time. Let's just go ahead and get in there now. Um, so those are just kind of nice because they give you a little bit of flexibility. Mary Elizabeth, did you say that that's a grant that they ask you to apply every quarter? No, more. sorry. They they have um, you have the option to apply every um, four times during the year. Gotcha. And okay. you apply once, but you choose when you apply throughout that year. Yes. Yeah. They'll have like they have their board meetings once a quarter, and you can apply for any of those. And sometimes they'll say, if you don't get it in the spring, apply again in the fall. Other times right. they'll say, if you don't get it in the spring, you have to wait till next spring. Um, that's just another reason why it's why it's really important to to read everything on a funder's website, because um, you'll make sure that you are a good fit, but also that you're following all of their rules. Because some of them have yeah. lots of rules. Got it. Amazing. All right. Any more questions here? Uh, there were no more questions in here. Um, Mary Elizabeth, did you have any other tidbits or points you wanted to add about writing grant proposals? Um, I mean, we can talk more about the actual proposal process. This is all like ramping up for the proposal, but I'm game to go where whatever direction is necessary. Um. I think you want to keep going on her list. I'm going down the list. Yeah. Then you have I two also, more steps. Yeah. <laughs> I also didn't yeah. know what time this was supposed to end. I just showed up with all of the things in my brain. No, no, that's that's totally fine. Yeah, we we have time to to kind of finalize the list. I think that that'll be good. Okay. So step four. Um, step four is tailoring the proposal. So like, I love what Sheena said earlier about being able to copy and paste different parts of your grant. And that's great. I have, I just have chunks of different grant responses. I know our statement of impact. I know our demographic focus. I have all of these pieces to common grant questions that I can copy and paste. However, I'm not going to copy and paste and walk away. I am going to revise and edit to make sure that I have answered that grants question. Because their questions are essentially the same, but I want to make sure that I am really addressing that that funder. I don't want to, like, if they're talking about being a catalyst, then I want to tie in that language into my proposal somewhere. So I'm going to copy and paste and then revise and edit to tie in the word catalyst and explain how the academy is a catalyst for people to start a small business. Um, so I'm paying attention to that grant, to that funder, and then tying in that language into my proposal avoiding jargon. Um, they don't know all of your particular techie sorts of words. Uh, so you want to make sure that you are making a proposal that anyone can read and anyone can understand. So that's another important thing with writing a proposal. Um, and then also using an active voice. So I would like to, I would say something like entrepreneurs gain tools instead of the program will give entrepreneurs tools to start their business. You know, you want to be really direct with what you're doing. You also want to save your character count or word count, because a lot of grants will say you can, you have a hundred words to answer this question. And if you're saying the program will give entrepreneurs tools, you're using a lot of words, a lot of characters. You want to shave that down and be as direct as possible. Um, because most people who read proposals are reading a lot of them. Um, you don't want to waste their time. Uh, you want to get straight to the point and tell them what you want and what you need uh, in a way that makes sense to them. So avoiding jargon, active voice, tying in who they are into what you're writing, uh, and then tying in what you need. So knowing your budget, knowing what you're looking for from this grant, um, 
and focusing on that as you write the proposal. If I'm writing a grant to compensate facilitators for the academy, then I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about how awesome our facilitators are, how their program alumni, how they're trained, what their business size are. Uh, and then when I get to the budget, they understand why I need money for facilitators. Uh, so those are probably the four big things when I'm writing the proposal that I want to focus on. Yeah, I, really I like the idea of like not using jargon. So if you call your the girls in your after school program chasers or shining stars or like you know how on on YouTube everybody has like hey sweeties or hey besties or you know like don't use those words because they're like what call you can say things like scholars or entrepreneurs or clients participants these are common you know but if you have something that's really specific unless you explain it on the front end uh, it's not worth it just. Just say regular words. <laughs> and then also, Mary Elizabeth actually does ours. I don't know if we said this, but in Google Docs or, or Microsoft mm -hmm. Word or something like that. Don't actually apply in the application and like fill it out there. You want to have it to where you can save it, edit it, maybe even let somebody look at it. Then again, you can put it into the application uh, database that they use. Also, we've been do doing a lot better. And I think we've seen a chance of like make using data. So even if you help 10 kids or if you've helped I've helped a single mom get an apartment, right? Yes, but no. Like you've helped someone who makes fifteen dollars an hour um, understand and, and afford, or whatever the right word is, an apartment that's twelve hundred dollars a month. That's over sixteen thousand dollars a year, right? Make it feel grandiose and make it not just don't lie about it, but really put some data, some money. Our entrepreneurs last year put thirteen million dollars back into the neighborhood economy. That's a lot. Uh, 13 million with an M, right? Um, if we talk about the impact, we say that the exclusionary practices and policies in you know, different spheres is a $1.6 trillion loss to the American society. That's a lot of money. And then we also have the data and we have the website like to support it. So it's not just a number floating out there because we got it from a study, but it's like, don't just say racism is a loss to America. Like put some money behind it, put some some really tangible things behind it. I think that really has made people when they talk to me have been like, I didn't realize. I'm like, recognize, okay. Yeah. Uh, and so that has helped formulate a, a story around why we do what we do. We don't, we didn't just start corner to corner because there wasn't enough nonprofits around. We started because we have a unique position um, mm -hmm. with the work we do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Y'all are making some phenomenal points. I, I should have been taking. Some it's on live. You can watch it again. Yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> exactly. Um, and Mary Elizabeth, before you go on to step five, a, a couple mm -hmm. questions that I wanted to make sure we tackled. Okay. Um, I think I know the answer to this, but I'll let you answer it. Are grants limited to a certain amount? Yes and no. Every grant is different. Um, you'll find some grants that are five hundred dollars, and so. In your research, you decide whether or not the work to get that five hundred dollars is worth it. Very important. And then you have some grants that are millions and some grants are for one year. Some grants are for three years. So you can find all you can find it all. It's all out there. Um, and just know that the work that goes into it on the front end and once you get the money and you have to report on that grant, that work is probably going to mirror the amount of the grant. So make sure you're ready for all of that. Got it. OK, OK. Um, so after. I guess you receive a grant. Is there any documentation that you should continue to hold on to or keep? Or did you start? Is there a document that you need to grab for uh, reporting or legal purposes? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Um, and there is no like hard and fast answer on this. You're going to get a contract. Uh, and you want to make sure you read that contract. In our case, Shana reads our contract. Um, <laughs> <laughs> resident legal expert. Um, she reads our contract and we, you know, pick out, oh, these are things in your contract that will probably be the details on when you'll get the money, how you'll get the money. Is it a check? Do they need bank direct deposit information? Um, and then what you have to report. And every grant is different. I wish, I, I, I so wish that this was easier. Um, it is slowly destroying my soul. It's fine. I'm recovering. Um, but grant reporting is a is a horse of a different color. It's wild. I'm learning so much right now um, because we have some grants that just have really different reporting requirements. Um, so you want to make sure you read that contract and whatever documentation a grant gives you to understand what is required. Some grants want you to 
at the very end, a year after you get the money, they just want a one sheeter that says you did it. That's all they want. Um, and those are we great. Like them. I we love like those. Them. Um, yeah. <laughs> like, yes, we did it. Um, here, watch a video of our graduation. The end. Um, other grants, though, they want to see receipts. They want to see payroll. They want to see um, surveys from participants. They want to know that the outcomes you stated in your application actually came to fruition and um, they want demographics. And so the answer is yes, there is probably something that you need to hold on to. You're not gonna know exactly what until you get that contract. Mm. Yeah, most of them, and this is what we do at Corner to Corner. So obviously you can watch this again, but if you're taking notes, I think this is a good place to start. If you're starting small, in my mind, I have a, a made up example of like, you doing like an after school program event once a month with 20 girls. Let's just use that, right? So mm -hmm. you're trying to get a grant. Mary Elizabeth said, is it worth it? $500 in theory, if somebody gave it to you on the street, yay. But if it takes you five hours, then you're like, okay, how much at my real job am I making for five hours? If you make $10 an hour, you're like, okay, it could be worth it. If you're making, if your hour is worth $100, you're like, this isn't worth it for me, but there are other things, right? So it's not that you're being bad and bougie. It's just that you have a lot going on and that they are, you may qualify for bigger grants that have the similar time. Let's just say you got a grant. When you first get there, you want to, you know, make sure their parents know what you're doing and they may sign a, either they can sign a waiver to say you can take pictures or they sign a permission slip or something like that, right? So everybody's clear that this is grant grant funded and you may have to take pictures you may have to report information and then if it's something about their school like test scores or readings then you need to understand do maybe a pre-test and a post-test that you can find online and you can make up to see if they're growing in reading if it's about race then you need to say oh eight out of the ten girls that i help are black girls and this is necessary right you got to get some demographic information for us, we do things like get zip codes because we serve certain zip codes. And so again, what she's saying is understanding, but you need to ask that up front, day one, and have that information, demographic, their, maybe their name, their zip code, their grade, their test scores, their race, um, things that they want to learn. Then did they learn those things? For me, especially with the adults, I take a lot of pictures. So y'all see probably a fourth or maybe half of the pictures that I take. My phone is a glorified corner to corner phone because people like to see vid videos and photos. And so I was, we got a grant about helping people apply for things. And I had, when people come, I say, hey, can I take a picture or a video? I'll just do a video of the room that I have five or 10 people in the room just so they know, like in real time, what's going down. Um, and then maybe we have those in the folder or whatever in the back end because the, that visual aspect is always really nice too. So if you're helping kids learn how to, read or make something, just turn on your phone in the corner and as they're doing pottery, you're just panning the room and you're seeing the laughs and you're seeing the ahas um, and it makes for a fuller picture of the experience for the grant funder. Mm -hmm. Good, yeah, yeah. If, you, if you've been around us, you know it's cameras all day. Okay. All day Beyonce don't have nothing on the amount of photography we do over here. Correct, exactly. <laughs> um, and before we go into uh, step number five, there's a question that's kind of industry specific. Uh, Mary said she was uh, opening a car wash or laundromat, and she just wanted to know whether grants out there for those type of businesses. But I think grants are, they come for every industry, just depends on the specifics of that grant. Yes, yeah, they come for every business industry. I've been finding quite a few, and I think I've sent some on to you, Jaren, to share with your your folks um, who their, their grants for people starting small businesses, whether, um, and there are a lot of them focused on minorities and focused on women, because um, that's kind of where the lack is in business ownership. Uh, so people are like, hey, we see we see this gap and let's, let's put some funds there. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Good to know. Yeah. Phenomenal. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Beautiful. Um, yeah. So that last step was really the reporting part. Um, so we kind of got there. Um, we did it all. Um, I think the other thing would be if you don't get the grant, try to follow up. Some people will say, don't talk to us if you don't get a grant. Others will say, contact us if you want to learn more, if you want to do better. Always do that. Always say, thank you for considering my application. We want to be more competitive next year. How do we do that? Um, so if you don't get a grant, you know, be a little, be a little discouraged, go eat some chocolate ice cream, but then follow up and figure out what to do next time. 
Chocolate ice cream, you, not vanilla. And when you follow up, I think, uh, and Darren kind of will second this, y'all, like, don't follow up like, hey, with a lowercase h, hey, comma, just want to know why we didn't get the grant question mark. Like, there is some, um, I don't know the right word is etiquette or mm -hmm. soft skills, right? Communication skills. You remember that even in your mind, if you're saying, hey, if it's on the computer, it looks like, hey, especially since you just got rejected from something. So you may want to, again, Google has everything you need, nine out of 10. You can Google like inquiry about why I didn't get a grant or inquiry about why I didn't get a job or something like that. And then you can tailor it, but see what other people are doing. Sign your name, make sure your email and your phone number is there. Tell them, thank you for considering them. Um, you know, don't try to repitch it. I really think we'll be good because that is not like, man, my original application before. So don't give me all the extra stuff. But I just think that sometimes even when I get emails and people have questions, it's very like demanding or straight to the point or Mm, feeling like urgent, Shayna, I need you to, I need to know da, da 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 I'm like, whoa, hello, I'm doing good. Good to see you too. Yes, I have a very busy day, but Friday works for me. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Um, and so I know you guys, so I know there's no harm, no foul, but when you're talking to people you don't know, just be very aware. Just be very aware. Maybe let somebody else read it and say, if you didn't know me, how would you take this email? Um, or if you really feel hurt, then give it some time to like settle the emotions of it. And then you can really approach it as understanding that this is business and they're doing what works best. And that there were a lot of applicants that may have just been more on the mark, but it wasn't personal. So if you can take the person out of it, you'll get a more robust experience. I saw that word. That was Jaren's word of the week last week. Um, and that you always can reapply. <laughs> you always can reapply you know, when it, when it opens again. So there are plenty of, Mary Elizabeth, what percent of grants do you think we don't get that we apply for? Yeah. Just, just guesstimate. Do you think it will be somewhere around 50, 70? Yeah, I would say, I, I would say like for the grants you've applied for this year, it's probably like 50, 50. Um, yeah. and yeah, yeah. So Corner to Corner has been around for 10 years. This is our 11th year in December. It will be 11 years. And we don't get half of the grants we apply for. If you are applying for your first five grants and you don't get, you get one of five or you don't get any, but literally this is your first grant. Like that's okay. It's, it's a process. There are nonprofits that have been around a hundred years. They have it down to a science. They have data coming out their ears. Right. You just have to understand what's going on. But also there are people and, and grant makers who want to open doors for the new up and coming. And so sometimes it may be like, hey, y'all are established. I don't need us. We're here for newer people. So we'll get rejected for that. And we're like, great, go with God. Because at one point that was us. And we appreciated people that had that kind of heart and space, too. So it's all about understanding that it's bigger than you. It's not personal. It's a business. Right. Um, and, and going from there, you can approach it as such, as a job, the same way that you would go into not only the business you made through the academy, but it's your day job as well. Yeah. And I would say with that also, like when you're starting out, you will probably get rejected more. Um, one of my favorite, one of my first grant memories is finding this grant and telling Will, hey, we should apply for this grant. I'm going to set up a meeting with them. And then he looks at it and says, I talked to them like five years ago and they said no. And I was like, it's been five years. And so we went in and we'll crush that meeting and they gave us money. Um, and I think that's just like, that was our first really big successful grant. And it was because we asked again, um, we tried, we failed, we grew, we figured ourselves out. We found a better, stronger, more clear identity. We figured out how to tell our story. And then we told our story so well. Um, and they're still a funder for us. Like they continue um, to fund our programs because they understand, they, they're now on board with what that we're doing. Um, so that's, yeah. Right. And, and a counterpoint to that is that we had a grant that we got one year, we didn't get the next year, we got again another year, they gave us less the year after that, right? And so you can't define if the program that you're doing is good or is worthy based on somebody else giving you money because if you're watching this and you know corner to corner, you know 
Ain't nobody messing with us, okay? But if I define our success as a staff or, our, or Mary Elizabeth's success as a grant writer on if we got these grants, my self-esteem or our brand org esteem, if that's the real thing, will be going up and down and halfway and not sure. And we just go with the flow, right? Because they may say, I have less money post-pandemic. I want to break it up. Or there's literally thousands of nonprofits in Nashville and they want to fund more, which means they gave half to some people or they, they looked at our budget and said, oh, y'all straight or y'all budget is small or y'all budget is big. Like everybody has an opinion on what you're doing. So just do you, give them the honest truth, make it interesting, exciting, enticing, and let the chips fall where they may and know that it's always somebody, not, if not today, then tomorrow that could, could fund you. And then the second thing I'll say on that, and I'll pass it back to Darren or uh, Mary Elizabeth, is if you have something that you want to start funding next year, I would just start playing around by applying for grants the rest of this year and be like, I'm cool with getting rejected the whole year because when February hit, we popping off, right? Mary Elizabeth said February is a very heavy month. So right now you're just practicing. You know, you're practicing, you're getting some feedback, you're sending it in, you're getting rejections, no sweat. Because in February, you're really gonna have some training. But if you wait till February, and when she's like, oh, I'm just gonna wait, I'm gonna do all the things, then you really don't have any um, experience under your belt to know exactly how you're tailoring and being clear, as she said, in your vision and your brand identity. I love that. Definitely practice. Practice is good. Yeah, there is one surefire way not to get a grant, and that's not to apply for Amen. it. Amen. Because we're gonna apply. Okay. So oh, y'all yeah. better get it so running. You have to apply. <laughs> don't don't get stagnant and think, oh, I don't know what I need to do. I don't have what I need to have. Try it, learn mm -hmm. from it, and then apply for the next grant. Because um, yeah. we'll continue to send out a plethora of grants. Um, Amy, I do want you to just can you review the five steps again? Mm -hmm. I'll pop them in the comments for everybody to have. Yeah. Okay. So my five steps. First, be grant ready. Second, find the grants. Third, do the research on, on the funder. Fourth, tailor your proposal. And then fifth, you have your follow-up, whether it be that reporting or the thank you, tell me how to do better next time. Boy, he over here type so slow. He's still on one. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, I, 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 I'm I, I sorry. You got to about step four. Yeah, they, they, they can rewatch it. They yeah, can rewatch it. If y'all were watching and you took notes, throw them in the chat. Help your fellow right. alumni. If you popping in at the end, baby, it's a lot of information in between. Just rewatch it while you're watching dishes or driving down the street. Um, and then again, this is gonna always be up and Jaren to send it out so you can you can tap into it. But my dog was typing slow. I was like, he, he not, he not on well, step five. Fast. I can't keep up with yeah. very little. He wasn't on step five at all. I was cracking up. Uh, yeah, I think that that's, that definitely apply, right? Definitely mm -hmm. make it part of your routine. Um, and we are excited about what the work that you all are doing. And we know that it's, it's fundable. You just have to be realistic about if you have no data, if you just now starting out, then you want to go for a little bit smaller funds, but you also want to go to people who have really lenient reporting or who seem like the people that they have funded before are new orgs or, you know, they have these kinds of conversations about the work that you're doing and they believe in the work. It really starts to snowball once you start having data, but everybody starts from nobody. And if you've been doing it without being a 501c3, you can still pull in that old experience, but some of them just won't let you apply for it until you get that official status. So again, you want to figure that part out, but you also can volunteer. You know, you can use the work that you've done in other orgs. You can use what you put on through your church as, um, you can't say that that's part of your org, but you can use it as examples um, or previous experience. You can say things like, although the organization is new, I'm not new to the work as, you know, a licensed clinician, blah, blah, blah. I mean, use that too. So I think get creative in the application and you'll be surprised um, about how people may really see your your story if you sell it don't make it boring y'all ain't nobody watching boring tv shows and ain't nobody funding boring proposals try to make it really exciting and get people excited about the work that you're doing yeah, yeah. yeah. well good um well i do hope this has been um a lot of usable information yeah. um i believe that mary elizabeth and shana has provided a ton of value um during this lunch and learn about grants um if you have any questions outside of this, shoot me an email. I'll get it answered. Uh, sure, Jen, they, if they comment on this video, yeah. it sends me a notification. Oh, uh, well, there you go. You can comment directly to this 
uh, video um, or you shoot me an email, whatever you prefer to do. We'll get your question answered. Um, if there are no more parting words, then we're going to wrap this up and we will see y'all next month on the next Lunch and Learn, which is going to be the third Thursday of September. But I'll put out some information about that closer to that time. But thank you for your time and we will see you next go round. Bye.